I went and washed and received my sight. How easily we can take for granted those gifts of God that we have never been without. One can hardly imagine having been born without the ability to see the light of day and to have experienced that lack of vision year after year, perhaps decade after decade. And then to meet this man called Jesus, who said, I am the light of the world. We must do the works of him who sent me while yet it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And then to touch our eyes and send us to the pool so that for the first time, here we are in the midst of God's world, able to visualize the creation he's made and the people we love and especially the Savior whom we have met. We can guarantee ourselves that if we had this man's situation and suddenly were given that which we would never had so we couldn't take it for granted, we would be radically different. We would be transformed. We would be engaged from that point forward to seeing everything we could see as something that he made and seeing every gift as fresh from his hand and seeing every person in darkness as one upon whom Jesus could shed the light of eternal life. This week, as you gather around your table, give thanks to God for that which you have always had, that you have never lacked. And treat your sight and your other gifts as if you just received them and ask how you might use them to the glory of God. The reconstructed model of Jerusalem, together showing the pool of Siloam and the street going to it, helps us recognize it was to the southern end of that temple mount. And as we zero in, looking at the current setting, you can see the pool down in that lower center area. The excavated portion, if you'll notice, it's just a slice there. It's a fascinating story. No one knew where this pool was until 2004. And then as the people of Israel were digging to restore a broken pipe, they found something under the ground that they had not noted before. Two ancient stone steps. They kept excavating and there was a monumental pool from the time of Jesus. 225 feet long in the shape of a trapezoid adjacent to that area called the city of David. If you look in that area down where they have opened it up, you can see the steps there from the first century. And you can place yourself where this man would have gone with his eyes covered over from light, darkness. And then his washing and his coming back and declaring to all, I was blind, but now I see. There is still today the channel with water flowing there. And underneath they have found the first century A.D. street. And Jesus and others certainly would have walked that way. The word Siloam means scent, as Hayden read to us a moment ago. It was water that was brought from the Gihon or Gihon spring outside of Jerusalem. In the days of Hezekiah, the 700s BC, there was already water coming in, but because of the invaders, he constructed a tunnel to draw the water from that spring into this pool, this scent pool. It's fascinating that John would note, perhaps as something of a double meaning, that Jesus sent the man to the sent pool and that Jesus himself was sent from heaven in order that he might rescue those who need to see the light of eternal life. It was from this pool in John 7, 37 and following that the water would have been taken at the Feast of Tabernacles. And on that occasion, Jesus said, I'm the water of life. And I will cause in you a spring of water, speaking of the Spirit, 
welling up to everlasting life. And that tunnel built by Hezekiah has also been uncovered so that archaeologists can see it's not straight, perhaps because of the hard rock or poor engineering, but eventually it brought the water to the city. We want to ask these basic newspaper questions. If your Bible is open there, first, why? Why was this man born blind? The Jews were convinced that sin was the cause of every problem. And God had said that future generations might suffer at least the consequences of sin, Exodus 20 and verse 5. Rebecca knew that Jacob and Esau had struggled when they were still within her womb. And so they're all too ready to fix the blame. Who brought this about? Someone's disobeyed God. There's some evil. There's some terrible event in the past. And that's why this man came into life this way. People still think that way today. But most often there's no direct connection between sin and cancer or some chronic condition, or difficult pain, or the loss of a limb, or the loss of eyesight, or hearing. And one can go round and round and round and never sometimes identify exactly the domino that moved that caused this event to occur. Where they sought to fix the blame, Jesus sought to fix the problem. And he changed the question and he asked instead, how can this turn to the glory of God? What could the result be? Not the past. We can't change that. But what decision, what action, what step could be taken right now so that God is praised and God is recognized? And brothers and sisters, you and I can do the same thing. During this holiday season that is approaching, there are many of us that have suffered loss and bereavement and grief and tragedy and setbacks and disappointments. And there's so much of us that wants to say, God, why, why, why? And through this tremendous sign, he helps us understand that no matter what our circumstances, if we will ask instead, how can this turn to the glory of God? We will know what to do. Our faith will be strengthened. Our future will be secure. And our effectiveness in the kingdom of God will be magnified. In Luke chapter 13, there had been a tower in this area, the Tower of Siloam, that had fallen and killed 18 people. And Jesus asked the crowd, do you think they were worse sinners than all the others, that that fell on them just because they were so bad? He said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So take the tragedies and the terrible events that you see in the world and recognize that one day this life will be over for all of us and we will stand before Almighty God and when you see someone who is hurting, someone who is sick, someone who is dying, don't you be the one ever to try to fix the blame, to try to lay on that person some guilt which is not deserved and has no connection at all to their experience. The next question, how were your eyes opened and this man begins to tell them, Jesus, he took dirt, he made mud, he put it on my eyes. I went to that pool where he directed me and, and I came back seeing. When? At the moment where his faith prompted him into action, I washed and now I can see. There's a clear illustration here of the role of grace and faith and works in which it was the gift of Jesus Christ that turned darkness to light and blindness to sight. It was his gift. It wasn't earned. This man wasn't worthy of it. He couldn't pay for it before or after. It was by grace 
It was through faith. Because he had to take Jesus at his word and have confidence and conviction that his eyes could be opened. And you and I admire this man for that. Wouldn't it be much more likely to say, it's impossible. You can't do this for me. I'm stuck in this rut. It's always going to be the way it's always been. Don't you know this is from birth? Don't you realize there's no doctors, there's no treatment, there's no cure for this? But no, faith. And that faith led to action. Because if the man had refused to wash, if he had not complied with Jesus' conditions, his directions, he would never have seen the light of day. And then the result of that was his telling his story, God's story, just as I am, without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me. I was lost, but I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was dead, but now I am alive. And what about you, my friend? Grace and faith and fruit. Here in your baptism, you have been or you can be identified with Jesus Christ by faith. You can go to the pool, as it were, and connect with what he did to save you, which is a gift of grace. It's unrepayable. And then when your faith prompts you to meet the conditions he's given, you rise and you start to walk and live anew. And the world looks different. People aren't the same as they were before. And your purpose, you're transformed, you're redirected. All because you met this man, Jesus. Who is he? Well, you notice as you read John 9... The man's faith builds from verse 11, the man they call Jesus, to 17, he's a prophet. Verses 30 to 33, he's a godly man. He's from God. He's been heard by God. And then starting at verse 35, he's the son of man, the Messiah, the Christ. And he says, Lord, I believe. And he worships him. Oh, such a controversy. You and I might think if we had been there, we would have recognized the Savior. And we would have followed Him. We would have listened and obeyed. And yet there were so many critics, cynics, skeptics who had nothing but resentment and unbelief and anger against this Jesus. Look with me now at the passage. What do you say about it? Verse 17. He's a prophet. Well, the Jews didn't believe it and they wanted to find some reason to discount and dispute it because it happened on a Sabbath day. And so they want to accuse the healer of breaking their tradition and their routine and their ritual. And so they questioned the parents, verse 19. Is this your son that you say was born blind? And they confirmed, yes, he's our son. Yes, he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. Now notice verse 22. The parents would not openly declare any kind of faith in Jesus. Why? Because they were afraid they would be kicked out of the synagogue. The leaders had already decided. If you acknowledge him, if you name him, you are shunned. You're disfellowshipped. You're removed and excluded. And so the parents are very, very cautious. Ask our son. It's called passing the buck. It's called shifting the question to someone else. We're not going to take responsibility. We're we're, we're just not sure. You and I can be like that. Timid about confessing Jesus Christ, which is to be a part of our lives, not just initially when we become Christians, but in circumstances where those are present that might not accept the good news we have to share. But notice something else. When they ask the son, they call him in a second time. Verse 24. And he tells them again, I was blind and now I see. What's the difference between the parents and the son. 
This is it. The miracle occurred for the son. Not for the parents. As much as they may have loved him and treasured him and rejoiced in his sight. It didn't happen to them. The more you and I see the people Jesus encountered. The lives he touched. The change he made. The more we hunger I don't want to be a different generation removed. I don't want to be at a distance. I don't want to be somebody just heard and just seen and then I'm, I'm, I'm quiet and, and afraid to share my faith. I want to be the person that can say, I was blind. Now I see. And I want everybody to know it. If they dislike me, if they reject me, if they shun me, and this son, in fact, is going to be kicked out of the synagogue as a result of his confession about Jesus. The fact that the sign occurred was proof that Jesus was heard by God the Father, that he was not in sinful rebellion against him, and therefore he had come from God. Now look at verse 34. They said to him, you were born entirely in sins, and are you teaching us? That charge reflects the presupposition they already had. This blind man, he must have been born out of sync with God, in defiance against God, apart from God. Otherwise, this wouldn't have happened. And that helps you and me realize that all of this man's life, he's not only had the physical disability, but he's had the emotional, the social confrontation with people. Can't you imagine, though we're not told exactly what he experienced, what he may have heard and how he may have been treated and the attitude others may have taken toward him. And did he ever believe that? Who is it? It's this man, Jesus. No, he's a prophet. No, he's a godly man whom God hears. And then the what question. What is true blindness? Starting at verse 35. It turns out that the man who knows he is blind and admits it sees more clearly than those who have their physical eyesight but deny that they're in spiritual Darkness. It's a paradox. It's an irony. It's part of the point of this entire sign. That those who say we can see are blind. But the one who says I can't see. I need Jesus to show me the way. That's the one for whom the darkness can be lifted. And the vision put in place and the focus provided. So verse 35, when Jesus heard they had put the man out of the synagogue, he said to the man, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said, you've both seen him, and he's the one talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, We're not blind too, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say, We see, your sin remains. The message of Jesus is so convincing, it's so convicting. The words that he spoke, the way he turned things upside down, the, the status quo, and the way people keep score and measure success. And here they had apparently put this man down because they judged him as being born already a sinner, and he wasn't. And here they are in their piety and their titles and their religious leadership. Here they are, folding their arms, looking down the nose, claiming to have the insight into everything and everyone. And Jesus said, you're the blindest people there could ever be. 
But the man that says, I'm blind, now I can do something with him. There's a message here about humility, about transparency, about openness, about confession. Rather than putting on a facade, some kind of pretense as if we have it together when we really don't. There was a song popular a few years ago. There is none so blind as he who will not see. And it described the fact that people tend to size each other up based on all kinds of external characteristics, making ourselves the standard and putting them in a pigeonhole or different category because of this or that, and pushing ourselves up higher. But it's the person who says, I can't see without Jesus. I don't know what to do without the Word of God as a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I'm lost. I'm helpless. I'm broken. I'm dying. And unless I meet Jesus, I'm never going to see things the way they really are. Now for that person, Jesus says, Go to the pool and wash. By grace, through faith, faith in action, according to the conditions that he's given, and then coming back from the pool for all the world to see a transformed person with a message, with a hope, with a purpose, with a joy that individual never had before this man worshiped Jesus why in part because unlike just about all of us he hadn't had the gift of sight from the time he came into this world he hadn't taken for granted he hadn't become entitled he hadn't expected that every day he could open his eyes and see what was out there and because he never had it when it was given to him, he overflowed with reverence, with awe, and with gratitude. I want to be that man. I know you do too. I want to treat the gift of eternal life as if I just received it. I want today to be like the day it was when I first came up from being baptized. And I could see, I could rejoice, I could anticipate, I could recognize the things of God unhindered. And that experience can be yours and it can be mine. When we put ourselves in this man's position, recognize our destitute state, acknowledge that we cannot open our own eyes, and then we obey Jesus Christ. And he opens our eyes. That's the Lord's invitation. If you're subject to it and would respond, do it now. Let's stand and sing.